I'm here with uh, Emily Coltman, FCA, so our Chief Accountant here at Free Agent. Uh, she's bilingual in both accounting ease and plain English, um, and she's going to be uh, taking and answering all the questions that we get today. Um, um, can you give us some background about uh, who you are and your experience, please? I certainly can indeed. Hi, folks. I'm Emily Coltman, and for short, I'm, as Adrian said, I'm Free Agent's Chief Accountant, and I'm a qualified accountant, but please don't hold that against me. I promise I don't bite. Um, I've been working with small businesses for the last 13 years. Um, I, do, I, um, I do still have a few clients of my own um, who um, all use Free Agent, naturally. Um, I have also written a few small business books, all about finance for small businesses in the UK, internationally, and also about VAT, aka very awkward tax. So qualified, experienced, but I promise I speak plain English, so I'm here to answer your questions. Excellent. Um, as we said, we're both from Free Agent, uh, online accounting for small business uh, businesses and freelancers. Uh, we do host regular weekly Q and A's with Emily on Google Plus and Facebook, um, where we do you know cover all kinds of topics about business finance. Um, but this Hangout's kind of trying something new. We've never done this before, so uh, bear with us, and hopefully it'll be fine. Um, the topic today is best practice for business bookkeeping. So let's dive in. Um, uh, I'm going to start just with a, a quick question, uh, first of all, and uh, if anyone else has got one, then uh, just jump in, uh, leave a message on the side, let us know, and, uh, and we'll just take them as and when they come. Uh, so first up, um, um, yep. do you recommend a good schedule to manage, uh, manage the books? I certainly do. I certainly do. What I've often found with clients is that it can be very difficult to um, to do your books in the midst of everything else you're doing as a business because you didn't go into business to be an accountant. You didn't go into business to be a bookkeeper. So it's difficult to put aside the fun things like making sales or doing marketing or meeting with clients in favor of doing your books. But as my mother always used to say to me about my music practice when I was a child, a little bit every day, or as we say, a little bit every week, is better than a huge rush right at the end. So what we recommend at Free Agent is that you put aside one hour, make it the same hour every week, and use that time to do your books. And I think that if no more questions come in, I think we're going to um, go into that in a bit more detail a bit later, aren't we, Adrian? Yeah, that's correct. We'll also um, we'll we'll post some links down the uh, down the side as well, and also yeah. on the uh, the event page as well. Um, uh, just back to uh, we've 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 got a sort of a white paper and and, and some some resources back on uh, on freeagent.com that will uh, that will post. Um, but uh, but yeah. So um, uh, next up, um, um, do you always have to in issue invoices? If you're registered for VAT, then the answer is almost inevitably yes, because it's actually part of the requirements for VAT that you have to issue invoices, and they have to be compliant VAT invoices. So make sure that you have a look at the revenue website, look in the area for VAT, and look at VAT invoices, because that lists everything that you need to put on your invoices if you are registered for VAT. If you're not registered for VAT, then strictly speaking, there's no legal requirement to issue invoices. Limited companies, I'd say you would probably have to, but if you're a small sole trader um, running a small business, then you could maybe do receipts instead. My suggestion is, though, that you should keep a record of what every piece of income is. That is something that the revenue say you should do. Um, why do I say that? Because if the revenue do ever come and look at your books to make sure that you're keeping them properly, they'll want to make sure that what you're recording as business income actually is business income and that there's nothing that should be listed in your business income you should be paying tax on that you've left out. So, for example, if you are running your bank account and you've got so many pieces of income coming in, you've got so many amounts coming in, and then there's something that just happens to be a check from Great Auntie Mavis for your birthday, you need to make sure that it's documented that this is my business income, it's for this customer, it was for this piece of work, and this is a gift from Great Auntie Mavis. Otherwise, the revenue may well try and say, well, look, I don't believe that's a birthday gift from your Great Auntie Mavis. Because your business income records are so poor, I think that's an income from a customer. I'll have some tax on that, thank you kindly. <laughs> Excellent. Um, cool. Is, uh, we've got some people that are, uh, that are joining in. If anyone, as I said, has got any questions, just come in and fire them through. If not, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll keep going with what we've got. 
Please do. Hello, uh, Will, Robert, and Freddie. We've got we've got with us so far. It's it's great to actually put a face to a name in two cases because I've spoken to you on uh, Google Hangouts on Google Plus rather a couple of times, but it's it's great to put a face to the name. So how do you do? Hi. Hello. Hi, Emily. Can I ask you a question about VAT and uh, a way of? So we're not registered for VAT yet, but mm -hmm. we're sort of approaching um, that sort of stage where we would. Um, the problem is with our business is that we like to do hearing care, so some of the things that we do is exempt uh. from, uh, from VAT. So I was wondering, uh, is there any way like in free agent to sort of break down like our invoices? So our invoices were approaching that sort of threshold of 79,000, but a lot of the things that we uh, bill for are non-exempt. So Okay. Is there a sort of a way to use free agent to sort of break it down, or not really? Okay. Well, just um, the first thing to um, to remember, Will, is that you don't actually have to register until your taxable sales go over seventy nine thousand. So you need to, as you say, separate out your exempt sales, your hearing care tests, from from the others. And it's only the taxable sales that um, will cause you to have to register. So if, for example, you're making five grand's worth of taxable sales and seventy four grand's worth of exempt sales, you don't have to register. Okay. Um, but in terms of tracking it in free agent, what I'd suggest you do is to set up a new income category for the exempt sales and call it something like hearing care exempt or something like that. And when you create a sales invoice for hearing care, make sure you put it into that category because then what you can do is you can look at your profit and loss account or you can look at your show transactions and you can see how much was actually exempt and how much wasn't by doing it that way and then you'll know that you only need to register when the taxable bit goes over the limit not when the what not when the total including the exempt sales goes over does that help yeah that does great thank you great cool uh, excellent okay I'll keep going then um, uh, next one we've got is um, how should I number my invoices Okay, well the rule for this is that each invoice must have a unique sequential number, that's what the revenue say. But those um, invoices don't have to be just one sequence. If you're a free agent user, then you'll know that you can number your invoices by global, for, so for your whole business, by customer, or by project. And that's perfectly OK. So long as each invoice has a unique sequential number, and so long as you can trace your sequences. So for example, you can say, if I happen to be invoicing Adrian, then I might have invoice AM001, uh, AM002. If I'm invoicing um, our colleague Danae, I might have DS001, DS002. That's perfectly fine, so long as I've got a complete set of sequential invoices. If, by the way, you make a mistake on an invoice, then strictly speaking, you should make sure that that invoice is, um, is still tracked. You shouldn't actually delete it unless it's just been in draft status and you haven't sent it to your customer. You should cancel it instead with a credit note. Okay. Um... okay. And we have a question in on chat, I believe, from Freddie. That's right. He asks, uh, how do you treat sales outside the UK with regards to turnover? Uh, should it be gross or the net figure that you record? OK, so I think what that question is asking is, if you're selling outside the UK, um, if you are recording turnover and you are charging VAT, um, because if you are selling goods or services outside the UK and they are to consumers, so as in they're not bus to businesses, they're to consumers, then you still have to charge them UK VAT. And in that case, you treat them just like UK sales when you're recording them in your profit and loss account. You would record them as net and you put the UK VAT into the VAT liability account and you pay that VAT to the revenue just like you would if the customers in the UK. Hope that answers the question for you, Freddie. If you're still stuck, please ask. Excellent. And yeah, just keep um, uh, putting stuff into the... Um, keep the questions coming. Keep the questions coming. Yep. Uh, <laughs> Oh, Excellent. you're not VAT registered, aren't you, Freddie? Okay, if you're not VAT registered, then there's no difference between gross and net for you. It's all the same. Brilliant. Hope that helps. Um, uh, next question I've got, Emily. Um, do I have to take payment by check? No, you don't. Um, there's no requirement that you have to take payment by check if you don't want to because there's quite a lot of big businesses now that say we don't accept checks. I would advise though that you make it clear to your customers before they expect to pay you that you're not taking payment by check. Make your payment methods good and clear, preferably up front. Um, 
actually a little story. My husband and I were at B and B this weekend for his birthday, and we only discovered when we came to pay that they didn't accept credit cards. So I had to get the car and do a run to the nearest cash machine. Thankfully, there was one only a few minutes away, but. You never know that that will happen. So my suggestion is make your payment terms and how you accept payment clear up front before you actually do the work for the customer. Then nobody gets an unpleasant surprise. Excellent. Um, next one for me. Uh, should I have separate bank accounts for my business and personal life? Separate bank accounts for your business and personal life. I would say unless your business is a very small sole trade, yes, every time. Because I, as an accountant, have had um, far too many cases where clients have not kept their business and their personal bank account separate. And then you get into the old problem that I was talking about a little bit earlier, where if you get a gift from Great Auntie Mavis, then you, um, then you cannot keep it separate. It's much harder to keep it separate in that case. My suggestion would be have a separate bank account for your business and use it only for business. Have a separate bank account for your personal life, use it only for that. The banks will often do a free business banking account for the first year or two of your business, so shop around. You don't have to use the same bank account that you do for your personal life. I do, but the main reason I do that is because I bank with Barclays and we've got the automatic data feeds into Free Agent and they were the first we had. But you don't have to necessarily use the same bank. If you find another bank that's offering better payment or better terms rather for a small business, use them. But I would strongly recommend because, as I say, the revenue say you must keep your business income and your business costs separate from your personal income and personal costs and having a separate business bank account will really help you to do that. Okay, um, next one from me, uh, how should, oh sorry, um, I'm not going to. Yep, hello well. Robert, yes. Uh, Robert says he's uh, just doing VAT return and realised that uh, I needed to have set up free agent for EU VAT prior to invoicing. Uh, also, that Google AdWords needs to be recorded as an EU payment. Okay, Robert, thanks very much for your query. Um, I think you've um, had a chat with one of our support team about that, which is fantastic. By the way, if anybody does have detailed queries about using Free Agent that we may not be able to answer here, you can email support at freeagent.com or you can phone our free phone support number, or quite often the support team will do a live chat. But in answer to your question, yes, if you're invoicing customers who are businesses and who are based in the EU, then you need to make sure you're invoicing them correctly. The best way to do that in free agent is to make sure that the ECVAT reporting is enabled, which is in the settings area, and you also need to make sure that you get the settings correct whether you're selling goods or services for the contact, and we've got more information about that in our knowledge base. Um, thank you. Yes, we've just, we've just got some contact details in for the support team. Thanks very much, Danae. Um, in, as far as recording EU payments goes, there's a couple of things for that. Um, first thing is, if you are buying goods in from the EU, then you do need to track what's called acquisition tax, which is the tax that you would have paid, the VAT that you would have paid had you bought that from the UK. Free Agent does do that for you. But if you're buying services from the UK, you're going to need to make a couple of adjustments to handle what's called the reverse charge. And again, there's a link for that in our knowledge base. Excellent. And again, we'll uh, we'll we'll post um, the the links and stuff to those uh, after Thanks, the event. So, uh, if anyone needs anything, then they'll either be here or we'll put them on the uh, on the event page. Or uh, if you can't right. find them, just email them us, and we'll we'll email them back to you. Thank you. Um, next one for me. Um, um, how should I track my costs? Okay, so if you're thinking about your business costs, it's important to keep a note of what they all are and what you spent them for because, again, there's a couple of reasons for that. The first is that if the revenue come looking, they'll want to know. Second, and perhaps more important, is that it helps you keep track of how your business is doing. So, for example, it's very, very easy to run up a whole lot of costs and you think, oh, I'll just buy that piece of software or I'll just buy that particular um, um, that or that particular piece of stationery or I'd like a new pen and you, before you know it it's run away with you so in terms of tracking costs you can do it on the move using something like free agent which is fully optimized for mobile or you can do it um, if you're spending money out of your own back pocket you can do that using something like receipt bank which lets you just photograph the receipt and it pops into your free agent accounts ready analyzed and explained so, you've, so it's important that you do that. 
and also make sure that as part of your hour a week you track what comes in as bills from your suppliers and you make a note of what you spent out of your business bank account. So for example if you went to Staples and you bought some box files using your business credit card, debit card rather, Make a note of that when you do your hour week bookkeeping. Have your bank transactions feed into free agent if you possibly can to cut yourself some time off and then explain each transaction one by one. So track everything you spend out of your own pocket. Keep a note of any bills from your suppliers you're not going to pay yet and also explain as soon as you can what each bank transaction is. Excellent. Um, guys, I just know that I'm, uh, I'm conscious that I'm kind of asking everything at the moment. So. As I said before, if, if anyone does have any questions, just fire in uh, whenever you want and, uh, and, and ask away, because uh, if not, you're just going to get more of, more of me asking. Uh, next, from, next from me is, um, do I need to keep paper receipts? Do you need to keep paper receipts? That's a very good question because the revenue actually say, no, you don't. Um, you don't have to keep filing cabinets and papers. You don't have to keep them in paper form is the salient point because you do have to keep them, but it does not have to be in paper form. You should keep them for six years after the after the, if you're a sole trader, you keep them for six years after the 31st of January after the end of the tax year. So, for example, if I'm a sole trader and the, I'm preparing accounts to the 5th of April every year and I've just done my accounts up to the 5th of April 2013. 31st of January after the end of the tax year is January 2014. I must keep those records to the end of January 2020. Limited company, you've got to keep your records for six years after the end of your accounting year, longer if you happen to have bought an asset. But in terms of do you have to keep paper receipts, no you don't. You can keep them in electronic form. You can keep them, they don't even have to be in the original electronic form. You can put them, for example, to microfiche if you really want to. Or you can scan them to something like deposit it. Um, the things that have to be in the form that they are in when you originally received them are things like bank interest certificates and dividend vouchers, things which have tax on them other than VAT. The revenue say those must be kept in their original form, but that doesn't necessarily have to be in paper form if you don't receive them in paper form. So no, you don't have to keep paper receipts. You can scan them. Some things have to be kept in the form you originally received them in. OK. Um, I think this is kind of going back to what we were uh, we, we touched upon very, very briefly at the start. Um, how should I file my paperwork? Okay, well, as an accountant, one thing I would say is that I've seen far too many messy files of paperwork. I can remember one particular client, he ran a pub, and this was in the days before the smoking ban. So every quarter when I did his VAT return, he just used to hand me a grubby cardboard box full of grubby pieces of paper that absolutely reeked of cigarette smoke, which made my job a lot harder, sorting through them to pick them out. He got a very big bill, bigger than it needed to be, because of the time I'd had to spend to sort them out and also he had no useful information about how his business was doing. So in order to make your record keeping nice and simple, in order to make sure that you can lay your hands on a document as quickly and easily as you can, my suggestion would be if you're actually keeping paper records, buy some lever arch files, don't bother with ring binders, you'll outgrow them, lever arch files with some file dividers, have a section for each bank account, file your sales invoices in number order, in date order, file your purchase invoices in supplier order, date order, basically whatever works for you. But the crucial point is, if you need to quickly lay hands on a piece of paper, whatever that might be, whether it's a bank statement, whether it's an invoice, whatever it might be, you need to be able to quickly lay your hands on any piece of paper you might want. Um, sh sorry, next question from me. Should I keep track of bills that I haven't paid for yet? And how do I do that? Well, absolutely you should, for two reasons. Firstly, and perhaps most importantly, is that if you don't track your bills that you haven't yet paid for, you stand an excellent chance of forgetting to pay them. And then you're going to be extremely unpopular with your suppliers because they'll have to chase you for payment. And OK, once we've all forgotten something once, um, it doesn't matter so much, but if you keep forgetting to pay, the supplier will mark you down as a bad customer, and then if you need the supplier to pull their finger out and do something really quickly to help you, then the thing is that 
they are not going to. If you're a bad customer, they won't make the extra effort to help you. But if you are a good customer who's paid on time, um, then they will help you when you really need it. So that's one reason why it's really important to do that. And the second is, from an accounting and tax point of view, unless you're using what's called the simplified accounting method that came in at the beginning of April this year, then you have to prepare your accounts on the basis of income that you've earned and costs that you've incurred. This is in the UK, by the way, not on the basis of cash, re cash received and cash paid. So that's the other reason why it's important to keep track of bills as they come in, because otherwise you might end up putting that into your accounts at the wrong time and paying the wrong amount of tax, which isn't a good idea. So how to keep track of them? My suggestion would be have a file for unpaid bills and that might be a folder in your Dropbox account or it might be a folder in your Google Drive account or it might actually be a physical folder that sits on your desk. Have a folder for unpaid bills. Make it part of your hour a week to pay your supplier bills, to pay anything that's due for payment. And then once you've paid a bill, transfer it to another folder called paid bills. That way nothing gets missed out. And don't forget as well to post the bill into free agent in the bills area. Okay. Um, so can I just check with everyone who's joined so far? Is this kind of the helpful topics for you or is there anything that you'd like us to elaborate on that we've touched on so far or, or something new that we haven't that you'd like to, 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 to see us talking about? Yeah, if there's anything that you'd like us to talk about, then please either just uh, just say something or put it in the chat box, because Adrian and I will quite happily talk away, but we need to make sure that what we're saying is useful for you, because that's why we're here. Um, okay, this is um, more of a sort of a UK-specific question um, for, for, for UK free agent users. Um, do I have to register for VAT? Do you have to register for VAT? Well, we had one or two questions about VAT early on. Not for nothing is it also known as very awkward tax. It's a pain in the neck. Um, do you have to register for VAT? Well, this is this relates to the point that Will raised earlier because his business makes some exempt sales and some taxable sales. Um, you have to register for VAT only when your taxable sales go through the limit set by the revenue and that is a rolling limit for, for the last 12 months or the next 30 days and at the moment it is £79,000 a year. So if and when your taxable sales go through that amount you've got to register for VAT. You can choose to register for VAT beforehand but you don't have to. That's called voluntary registration. Um, if your sales are to the general public, then you shouldn't voluntarily register for VAT, I wouldn't say. I would say leave registering as long as you can if you're making sales to the general public, because for them it's going to represent an extra cost, because they can't then reclaim that VAT. If you're selling to other businesses who will themselves be VAT registered, they won't mind if you register, because they can reclaim the VAT you charge them most of the time. So if you are selling to the general public, don't register voluntarily, I wouldn't say. If you are selling to other businesses, then it doesn't represent an extra cost to them. Just to recap on what I mentioned about taxable sales, um, Will said that some of his sales are exempt, and but some of them are taxable. And what are taxable sales? Well, in the UK, there are three different rates of VAT. The standard rated, which is 20%, and that applies to most goods and services in the UK. There are others that are reduced rated at 5%, and those apply to what I call quasi-essential goods and services, things that you could do without if you really had to, but you don't want to. For example, domestic heating, that's 5%. And the third and final rate is 0%, zero rated. Now, that is still a rate of VAT. Those sales do have VAT on them. It's just 0%. I know that sounds crackers, but I promise you it's true. That's, that's what that is. And that is the most common example of zero rated sales for VAT is travel. So if you buy a train ticket, for example, that's going to be zero rated for VAT. So is a plane ticket. So your taxable sales are any sales that you make that are standard rated, reduced rated, or zero rated. Not any sales that are exempt. Not any sales that are what's called outside the scope of VAT, which is different again. It means sales that are not subject to UK VAT at all. Classic example is your MOT test. Also, some road and bridge tolls imposed by the government, they're outside the scope. Okay. Um, sort of following on from that, um, do I have to charge VAT to all my customers? 
If you're registered for VAT, then when you have to charge VAT will almost certainly not depend on who your customers are. If you're registered for VAT and the particular sale happens to be taxable, you've got to charge VAT to everybody. I think there might be an exception if you're selling to certain charities, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Typically, on a day-to-day -day business basis, the rate of VAT you charge depends on what you're selling, not who's buying Excellent. it. Excellent. Um, and uh, I take it for the you know, for a useful resource of where to to find sort of the the yeses and nos from that would be to to go to HMRC's HMRC's website. Yes. Yes, but we have also got a free ebook which I've written called Very Awkward Tax, which is all about VAT. And as I say, it's free and it's available to download. And I'm sure Danae and Adrian will share the link to that. Just the other point to raise there in terms of when you charge VAT depends on what you're selling. The other exception to that is, is if you're selling to customers outside of the UK. If you're selling to customers in the wider EU or the wider world, different rules will apply. So again, do your research and have a look. Excellent. And will that be the same for, um, for, for customers outside of the EU or is it just within? Um, customers outside the EU, the rules could well be different again. So yes, make sure to check your um, to check the rules. Oh, Danae, thanks for the link. Yeah, so the link to, to, to M's uh, free book is just on the side there for yep. very awkward tax. Um, we're gonna, I was going to start looking at uh, just some sort of general topics to, to chat through. That's all my sort of specific questions gone. Um, but back to, uh, to bring it back to, to time of bookkeeping in general, um, what should easy bookkeeping be like? Like, how do you know if you're doing well with it and how yeah. you know, if your system is good or mm. how you make your system good? Yeah, well, the f the feeling that you're sort of in the zone that what you that what you're doing feels right, that it doesn't feel like a chore, is always a good place to start. If you if what you're doing feels smooth and it feels easy and it doesn't feel like oh my god, I really don't want to have to do this, then I think you're on the right lines. But in terms of what does a really great business bookkeeping system look like from the point of view of a business owner, from the point of view of an accountant, well. As a business owner, you should never have to put the same information into your bookkeeping system twice. You shouldn't have to put in an invoice and then go and update the list of what your customers owe you. That should all be done automatically. You should know exactly where to look for everything and it shouldn't take long to find the information that you need. So for example, you might think, oh, I need to find out if Mr. Smith owes me £500 from that last invoice. You should know straight away where to go and look. And that also holds true if you're keeping paperwork records, by the way, um, to go back to the question that Adrian asked me earlier. If you are keeping records, excuse me, I think I might be going to sneeze. I apologise if I do sneeze. <laughs> Pardon me. So in terms of looking for records, you need to be able to put your hand on a piece of paper really quickly and easily. And it's the same with your bookkeeping system. If you're keeping your records, for example, on free agent, you need to know where to go and look for whatever it might be. You should also get useful numbers reported back to you on a regular basis. So you should know daily, weekly, monthly, whenever you need that information, you should be able to get that information quickly and easily. Um, some of you might well have already seen our latest addition to the Free Agent Family, which is the Monday Motivator, that every Monday morning you get into your inbox an email which says some useful information like how much you've got due from your customers, how much you owe, you owe to your suppliers, time that you haven't yet invoiced yet. That kind of useful information should be there at your fingertips from your system. Your book should run smoothly on a day-to-day -day basis. It should be easy to add information. It should be easy to access information. It shouldn't just be that you can only get to your books if you are at a certain place or at a certain time. You shouldn't have to wait until your accountant's done your records to get the information. And on the subject of your relationship with your accountant, it can and will be radically different if you're using the right bookkeeping system. Um, I've worked with clients in the past because when I trained, there were, were no online bookkeeping systems. And after I qualified, they started coming out very much in their infancy. And working with clients was much more difficult at that stage because they would bring in a pile of paperwork, We'd go through and we'd prepare the accounts, and then at the end of the year, months after the end of the year sometimes, we'd be able to produce them a set of accounts. But by then, the business had moved on. 
plus the fact that we often had to sort out muddly paperwork. I can think of one client in particular who had his own bookkeeping system, had his own uh, filing system, and I couldn't understand it for the life of me. And that meant his bill was much higher than it needed to be because it took me so much longer to unjumble his records. I did try to advise him to change it, but he wouldn't listen. Whereas if you're using the right kind of bookkeeping system, then your client will be, you as a client can rely on your accountant to be a trusted business advisor. For example, I have one client who used to be based in Staffordshire, I'm based in Cumbria. Every quarter when he's ready to do his VAT return, he'll email or Skype or text me to say, I'm okay, VAT time. I'll go online, he'll be online in his home in Staffordshire. Every so often I refresh the page to see what he's posting and then if I find that something's wrong, I can pick the phone up I can say, Bob, why have you just put that entry into staff entertaining? You don't have any staff, you need to move it to business entertaining. I can do that for him at the time. He hasn't got to wait until after he's done and filed the VAT return. Doesn't have to wait until after year end. So I'm keeping him right with the revenue and I'm keeping his accounts right. Plus the fact that I can be saying to him things like, are you charging enough to that customer? Your profit um, doesn't look particularly high. Or on that particular project, you've made less profit than you normally do. What's happened? Could we do it differently next time? Might you have to put your prices up? Or why have your bank charges gone up? Ah, the bank's finished your free banking period. Okay, well, could you maybe move your bank? Could you negotiate? Could you do something differently? Your accountant can be a really proactive, trusted business advisor. And finally, and perhaps most importantly of all, your information is secure, it's safe. If you are keeping your information somewhere, perhaps just on one computer, so you're using a spreadsheet, what happens if that computer's lost, stolen, broken, corrupted, your books are gone? Whereas if you're using the right kind of system, then your information will be there, accessible, securely backed up, ready for you to get out any time you need. Cool. Um Kind of following on from that, um, um, yeah. what, in your opinion, does a bad bookkeeping system look like? You know, what, what, what <laughs> How long have you got, Adrian? <laughs> um, uh, we've got another 17 minutes. So, uh, okay, yeah, okay, so, so I can't talk for too long. What does a bad bookkeeping system look like? Well, basically the opposite of what I've just described. In a bad bookkeeping system, it's hard to get any information. Your information's out of date. Um, you don't know what particular costs are and you miss out on tax relief because your accountant can't claim something that you don't know what it is. If you, for example, you got a cheque for £500 six months ago and you can't remember what it was, your accountant may well have to say, well, we can't put that in the accounts. And if it did happen to be a business cost, you just lost out on tax relief. So, um, and also, you've, if you are having to put through regular dummy entries to make your books balance, that's not good. I had one client years ago who um, he used an offline system and every month he would put through a adjustment to make his bank account balance and I had to go back to him and say, look Tom, I'm sorry your books don't balance. Yes they do, he'd say, and I'd say, no they don't, they've got all these adjustments in, we need to straighten that out. So that would, that would certainly be one case. Um, of, of where of where it's of where it's not good. The other the other thing that makes a bad bookkeeping system is trying to use the wrong system for your business. If you try to use something that's either too complicated or too simple for your business, then you're going to come unstuck. Too complicated means perhaps you only use a very tiny fraction of it. Put it this way: the first time I looked at a particular well-known system, I'm not going to use its name because that would be libelous. But if I looked um, when I the first time I actually looked at that, I burst into tears because it was so complicated I couldn't find my way around it. I'm an accountant. But if you try and use a system that's too simple, you may well find that you can't record everything you need to. Um, so for example, if you are managing something like stock and you need delivery notes and you need um, multiple warehousing or something like that, you need to make sure you pick the right system. Um, so, that, so, that, so that would be that. And the other what does a bad bookkeeping system looks like is it's full of errors. I've, um, I mentioned the adjustments, but I think the worst ever set of books I've ever seen were kept by a bookkeeper, for goodness sake. And I've also known one case where I had a client whose um, 
I think she was his soon-to-be ex-daughter-in-law, had done the books, and she'd put all her customer invoices in as if they were bills, and all her bills in as if they were customer invoices. So basically that meant she got no useful information about the business. Um, she had not a hope of knowing what the tax position should be. She was paying the wrong amount of VAT. So errors to the tax man, errors to the board, and finally, the directors had a huge accounting bill to sort it all out. So basically, keep it simple, do it right, have all your information. Excellent, and uh, and do it often as well. I mean, um, I remember we we recently actually did some uh, some research with um, with uh, the guys at YouGov. We're asking people how often they checked their. Um, uh, the, the, the cash flow of their position, how often they did their accounts. Um, it was quite surprising because there was a lot of people that were doing it, you know, um, you know, every two months, <laughs> every quarter. There was some just doing it once a year and even more than that, you know, and um, uh, I, I think if you start getting down that path, it's, uh, it, 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 it's not particularly great for your bookkeeping either. Absolutely not. Excellent. And uh, uh, stuff in the receipts in the shoebox? Yep. Not a good idea because you will not get any useful information at all about your business. If your receipts are just bundled in a shoebox and you haven't tracked, for example, how much you spent on travel, how much you spent on accommodation, you haven't got a snowball's chance in hell of knowing if you're spending too much in certain places and not enough in certain places. You won't know how much tax you can expect to pay. You won't know whether you should perhaps put your prices up to compensate for extra costs. You might be losing money and not know it. You might be sitting on a million pound business and not know it. Okay. Um, uh, next one. Um, uh, if you could tell all your clients only one thing that would improve their bookkeeping practice, what would it be? Well, funny you should ask me that because the answer is do your books more often. <laughs> exactly like we've just been saying because there's plenty of business owners who do their books only, as you said, once every two months, once a quarter, once a year. That is really not a good idea. So if I could tell, and rest assured I have told my clients this one thing that would improve their business bookkeeping practice, it would be do it more often. Do it once a week. If your business is tiny, you might get away with doing it once a month. Otherwise, get into the habit of doing your books regularly. At Free Agent, we really do reckon it only takes an hour a week to keep your books in good order. So make it a habit. Um, make it part of your regular business routine. I realize that doing your books is not as interesting as I say as making sales or doing marketing or doing the exciting stuff, but it's something that's really got to be done and it's something that you can incorporate into your routine so that it doesn't feel like a huge big chore every month because to be honest, the longer you leave your books, the bigger the chore gets. Think of it as like a little goblin sitting in the corner of the room. You leave him alone for too long, he grows into a great big ogre. Whereas if you make it make an effort to um, to sort him out every week, he doesn't get any bigger. So make it a habit. Um, to generate a habit, you need to start from a cue. You need to have something that triggers, that reminds you to actually do your books. And why not make that the Monday Motivator email when it comes in? If you don't do your um, books on a Monday morning, then why not flag that email or star it in your inbox so that you know it's there and you come back to it? Otherwise, you, um, that cue is lost. But it doesn't have to be that. It might be, for example, that every week you go to a business networking event and when you come back you like to do your bookkeeping. Make the queue work for you and your business. The same one won't work for everybody. It doesn't have to be the Monday motivator. Just make sure you have a queue. And then make it part of your business routine so that perhaps as going back to the example of the networking event, you might come back from the networking event, have a nice cup of coffee, sit down and do your books and it's all part of the regular routine. So build it in to that routine. I'm thinking back to when I was a student, the class I hated the most I scheduled for Monday morning so that I could do it and get it over with, then immediately the class was finished I'd go and do my homework and then I could forget about it for the rest of the week. And that, and that was that done. So that was my routine, to do the, court, to do the class on the Monday morning, then to go and do the homework, and then it's done. And then make sure you reward yourself. So for example, after I'd done my assignment for that week on that particular course, I would go and make sure I had a cup of tea and a Danish pastry. Make it part of your routine, build in a reward for yourself. So you say to yourself, okay, if I do my books, then I can go and have a cup of special tea, or then I can have a piece of chocolate, or then I can go and have a walk around the park with the dog. Whatever it may be, make it part of your routine and build in a reward. Okay, um, um, I'm going to um, 
uh, look at a couple of uh, sort of specific topics back from uh, from, from previous uh, previous Q and A's that we've had. Um, Absolutely fine. A little bit on kind of expenses and cash flow, and a wee bit on on invoicing, just to do uh, to take up the last ten minutes. Um, the question we got a, a a couple of weeks ago, which I think is quite uh, quite a good one to to put here about cash flow and how what's the best way you sort of forecast your cash flow. Um, could you answer that uh, for us, if that's okay? Delighted, delighted. So, what's the best way to forecast your cash flow? Well, I think before I go into that, I might just pick up on what is cash flow and why is it important. Well, mm -hmm. cash flow is the money that comes into your business and goes out of it. So that's the money that comes in from, say, your customers, and gets paid out to your suppliers, your staff if you've got them, the revenue, and of course to yourself. So that's all that cash flow means. It's just a posh accounting term for that. In terms of why is it important to forecast it, you need to know if and when your business is at risk of running out of cash. Because if your business runs out of cash, you won't be able to pay your bills, you won't be able to pay the revenue, you could risk going out of business if you haven't got enough cash. It's a cliche to say cash is king, but it's very true. So you need to make sure that your business isn't at risk of running out of cash. So, for example, in your business, you might be thinking, oh, I'd like to do a particular new project. For example, if you are a crafter, you work at home, you might think, oh, I'd really like to have a studio so that I can perhaps install a kiln or a big sewing machine or whatever it might be. But the thing is that you won't know if you've got enough cash for that unless you draw up a plan and you do a forecast. So there's a couple of ways you can do this. There's a tool called Float, and it would be brilliant if, Danae and Adrian, you could pop up a link to that. Yep. With, thank you, which integrates with Free Agent, and the beauty of that is it pulls across your invoices, your bills, and helps you to build a forecast based on that. So when do you think your invoices payments are going to come in? When do you think you're going to have to pay your bills? And you can then do up a line-by-line -line forecast to show, for example, this is, this is how much I think I'm going to spend on travel. This is how much I think I'm going to spend on stationery. This is what I'll have to pay my subcontractors. And then it slowly builds up like that. So that's really, really good. The other way to do it is a good old-fashioned spreadsheet, um, which has the advantage of you can tailor it um, very, very, very specifically to your business. So those are the two tools you could potentially look at using. OK. Um... Uh, I've just that we've got a question in from Freddie. How do you record loan received from family and when you pay it back? Well, that's a very good point, Freddie, because Money that um, has been lent to you by someone in your family, um, you don't have to count that as income from your business. So if you're using free agent, what you need to do is you set your family member up as a user of the free agent account. You don't have to give them access. You can dial the user access level down to no access so that that family member can't log in. What you then do is you record that money coming in as money received from user. And if you're a sole trader, you call it capital introduced. If, you're a, um, if your business is a limited company, you call it payment to director loan account. Even if that person's not a director, you can still put it in there in free agent. And then when you pay the money back to your family member, you do money paid to user. It's drawings if you're a sole trader. It's payment from director loan account if you're a limited company. So I hope that answers your question, Freddie, and thanks very much. Excellent. Um, everyone, we've got about sort of five, six minutes left. Great. So if there's uh, any kind of last minute questions that, that you guys have that you want us to answer, uh, then um, get in and, and pop them up now. Um, I've got a couple more sort of cash flow y kind of questions, uh, cash flow and invoice questions, um, uh, if that's okay for you, Em. Um, yeah, I'll probably just, uh, yeah, I'll uh, just do this one first. Um, what should I do if my customers don't pay me? What should you do if your customers don't pay you? Well, yeah. ideally, don't get into that situation. Um, th make, it, make it your business to delight your customers, to make them go away thinking, wow, with a great big beaming smile on their face, because then they'll gladly pay you. Or they should, theoretically speaking, but there is always the case where somebody either forgets to pay you or runs out of money themselves or for whatever reason, and it might be because of something they've done rather than something you've done, they're not happy with the service they've received. So what should you do if a customer doesn't pay you? Well, firstly, don't let it go. Follow it up. Find out why they haven't paid you. They might just have forgotten. They might have gone away on holiday. So make use of something like the automatic invoice reminders in Free Agent to just make sure it stays at the front of your customers' minds. Um, if that doesn't work, then try phoning them. Try discussing it with them. It may well be that they've got a short-term cash flow problem, and you'll need to come to some arrangement for how they can pay you back. They might be able to pay you, for example, a certain amount a month. 
or if the customer says they're not happy with their service with your service then you might need to possibly think about um, offering them a discount or offering them something extra free or something like that you can resolve it but that needs to be resolved on a case by case basis I would say only go to the limits of charging interest or taking the customer to court in as a very last resort because if you do that then the customer is not going to want to deal with you again and that might of course be a very good thing if they happen to be the kind of customer that is always asking for something extra and always wanting the price dropped and and, and, and is always argumentative they may well be the kind of customer you don't want to deal with don't fall into the trap because I think it is a trap don't fall into the trap of thinking every customer is always right because they're not you can't be all things to all men there will be people who for whom your service isn't the right thing and then it may well be wisest to terminate the relationship and sometimes you might have to do that on the back of an unpaid invoice but I would certainly say don't let it go um, give the customer the benefit of the doubt they might have just forgotten keep following it up but only go through the interest and the legal route as a last resort Okay. Um, if you have uh, customers, as you said, you mentioned at the start, customers that, that have maybe forgotten to pay you or, or, or that kind of thing is there anything that you can do to, to prompt them to pay you quicker? There absolutely is. Um, what I would suggest is that you make it as easy as possible for your customers to pay you. So for example, consider taking online payment instead of taking payment by cheque because if you take payment by cheque, your customer's got to write it and post it and you've got to receive it and bank it. It's a lot of effort so make it as easy as possible for your customers to pay. Put your bank details on your invoices so that your customers can pay by bank transfer. Consider taking online payment using something like PayPal or Stripe or Go Cardless. Remember they all integrate with free agent. Excuse me. Make it as easy as possible for customers to pay because people will more readily do what's easy. Pardon me. What's easy for them? Okay. Um, so we've got another question from Freddie. He says, uh, "How does one treat refunds for goods returned?" Thanks, Freddie. So, in terms of how does one treat refunds for goods returned, if that's in free agent, then I would probably suggest you you ask the support team about that, Freddie, because they'll have to help you deal with that carefully in terms of when the goods were returned and why and how you've invoiced for them. So, that's quite a specific question, so I'd probably suggest you drop that to the support team. Cool. Um, I think that's, um, that's all the questions for me. So, um, if anyone has a very final one to answer, then um, then you know, shout up and, and pop it in. Um, Thank you, Robert. Yes, Robert said he found the PayPal payment via free agent invoicing is excellent. He's still working through the equivalent in WooCommerce. So I'm glad you found that useful, Robert. That's good to know. Thanks very much. Excellent. And uh, as ever, you know, if, if, if there's something that you're uh, that, that you're not clear on or you need some help, then uh, our support team's always there to to sort of take any questions and uh, and, and and help you through it. So uh, so yeah, don't be shy of uh, of giving them a shout as well. Um, okay. If no one else has anything, that's uh, all it from me. Uh, thanks very very much for everyone for for popping down. It's really yes, really good you. session today. Um, once again, we are going to post links through to our uh, hour a week white paper uh, as well. That's uh, it's covering a lot of the stuff that Em was talking about earlier on about uh, you know using uh, an hour a week to you know, to really get on top of your books and stuff. Um, we'll post that up on the event page. We'll post it in the uh, in, in the comments here. And uh, yeah, if if you don't find it on either of those places, just uh, just drop us a, a, a line on one of the social channels, and we'll uh, we'll send you a direct link. Um, in fact, I think Denise just done it now. Um, yeah. But that's brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, everyone. And uh, yeah, we'll have uh, another live Q and A certainly next week. Um, might be a hangout. Might just be back through to the event page. We haven't decided yet. But um, keep an eye out, and, uh, uh, and and we'll get those details to you soon. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you everybody for coming along, and thanks Adrian for being a co-pilot. Not at all. Bye.